welcome, this is Mouse Gunner, and in this video I'm going to showcase a couple more revolver designs, this being my third video in a series covering how revolvers work. In my first video I covered Colts starting in the beginning part of their history and moving along through time showing some basic tenets of how revolvers work and how their design, design has changed over that time period. My second video showcased some alternative brands and how things may be done a little bit differently, as well as a couple odd examples. Although these examples were odd, they were either popular in a particular time period or an example of design that you can purchase today. For this video, I'm going to step a little bit more into the odd and showcase some unique revolver designs. And the first example I'm going to take a look at is the model 1895 Nagant Revolver. Now the Nagant Revolver is a gassier revolver and I'm stepping into the real world for the initial part of this video to showcase one element of its design maybe a little bit harder for me to show you once I get into the program that I typically use and that is the ammunition that the Nagant uses. Now as a comparison I have a 38 Special cartridge right here. Now the 38 Special cartridge is a cartridge that's found commonly in modern revolvers and it has a more typical seating of the bullet, with the bullet extending beyond the cartridge case for the most part. Only the base of the bullet is within the cartridge case itself. Whereas with the Nagant revolver's cartridge, the bullet is actually seated within the cartridge case, and the cartridge case actually extends beyond the depth of the bullet to some extent and is pressed in at the end, as you can see here. Now this is important to the design of the Nagant, and I'll go over in more detail once we jump into the program and go over the functionality of the revolver. And now that we find ourselves in the simulation, I'm going to go ahead and start things off by identifying the three main components of revolver functionality that we've seen in all of our other examples. So starting off with the cylinder found here. The cylinder has a number of chambers cut into it here that contain the cartridges. Now in this case there are seven chambers, so you might oftentimes here a revolver referred to as a six shooter that terminology doesn't always apply in this instance we actually have a seven shooter we also have the cylinder stop which is responsible for uh, making sure that the cylinder is in line with the barrel or at least kept in that alignment and in the nagant it's actually found here this hump on the top of the trigger so it's not a separate part as we've seen in some other examples. And then our third part is the hand, which is also attached to the trigger, but is a separate part that comes up in here and contacts the ratchet teeth on the back of the cylinder. And as the revolver is operating, uh, either by cocking back the hammer or by pulling the trigger in double action mode, the hand will revolve the cylinder into position to get that each chamber in line. And then of course, as we mentioned, the cylinder stop once that uh, chamber is in line with the barrel is going to lock it in place so Let's go ahead and take a look at all of those parts in action as we operate the mechanism by cocking the hammer back So as we cock the hammer back, it's going to pivot along the pin that attaches it to the frame here And as it pivots, it's going to come underneath the rear end of the trigger and pull upwards on it And as it pulls up on it, it's going to force the hand that's also attached to the trigger upwards and as the hand comes up it's going to come underneath the ratchet teeth pushing up on it and as we've seen in other revolver examples it's going to in turn rotate the cylinder around bringing the next chamber into alignment with the barrel and as that trigger rotates up the hump on the trigger right here will slot into the cutout in the cylinder locking the cylinder in place preventing it from revolving around out of alignment and keeping that alignment you're also going to see the cylinder come forward as we get to the end of the cocking the hammer and that's part of the gas seal mechanism that we're going to go over next so as we've seen before, when the hammer gets cocked back, it's going to come up underneath the trigger and pull up on the trigger. And as the trigger comes up, it's eventually going to contact this part here via this surface. And I don't know the official names for these two parts, and just for simplicity and ease of differentiation, I'm going to name these parts myself. So this part here, I'm going to call the pusher because it's responsible for pushing the cylinder forward. 
And this part here, I'm gonna call the slider because it slides up and down. So as the trigger comes up, it's eventually going to contact the slider, pushing upwards on the slider. And as we said, the slider slides up and down, it's gonna slide upwards along a track in the frame. And eventually this slope surface here on the slider and this slope surface here on the pusher are going to contact. And once they contact, they're going to slide along each other. And because the slider is in a cutout track in the frame, it can't go forward or backwards. It can only go up and down. But the pusher attached to this pin here that is also affixed to the frame can pivot forwards and it does so. So as it pivots forward, it's going to come into contact with the rear of the cylinder and push it forwards. And once it gets fully forward, we can see the slider here is now locked in behind the pusher. Now this is important because the cylinder itself is spring loaded. This is how the cylinder returns to the rearmost position. We can see that as we come back in the x-ray. This piece here, which I'll refer to as the plug, is fit within the center of the cylinder, as is this spring. So what happens as the pusher brings the cylinder forward is that the plug is butted right up against the front of the frame here. And it cannot move any further forward, but the rear of the cylinder is moving forward and it's pushing on this spring. And because of the set length of the plug, that is compressing the spring. So you can see that happening now as the cylinder comes forward it's compressing the spring. And if we come back into the x-ray, so that compressed spring is trying to use its spring tension to force the cylinder back to the rear. But because the slider here is locked in behind the pusher, it prevents the pusher from being able to come back. So this locks the whole cylinder into this forward position. And it's not until we drop the hammer and release the trigger that the slider will come back down, allowing the pusher to move freely rearward. To wrap up our look at the mechanical function of the Nagant revolver, let's go ahead and see what happens when the trigger is pulled fully to the rear and the hammer drops forward. So with that trigger pull, we're gonna see the sear here on the back end of the trigger, breaking its contact with the hammer. Once that contact is broken, the mainspring here, which is a V-spring, is going to act upon the hammer, driving it forward, as we can see there. And as the hammer comes forward, the firing pin is going to strike this slope surface on the slider. And once it does that, it's going to pivot upwards. Now, this whole pivoting action is important because the firing pin is affixed to the hammer, but it's also important to note that the firing pin and the hammer are separate pieces, as you might just be able to make out here. So we have this pin that is driven through the hammer that attaches the firing pin to the hammer. But because it's just this singular pin, it allows the firing pin to pivot up and down. This pivoting motion is important because of the pusher. How the firing pin comes through and strikes the primer on the base of the cartridge case is through a hole in the pusher. But because the pusher moves back and forth, you have to allow some movement in the firing pin because the pusher could be fully to the rear position with the hammer uh, down, or it could be fully to the forward position with the hammer down. In either instance, the firing pin has to be able to go through that channel. So to allow for that, we have a pivoting firing pin. And to make sure that it goes into the hole, we have the slope surface to direct it upwards into the hole. And there you go. The firing pin is now within the cavity and the pusher has struck the primer on the cartridge, firing off that cartridge. So now we're gonna have the trigger reset. So as the user of the revolver lets the trigger out, the main spring here, the other end of the V-spring, is going to push downwards on the trigger, pivoting it around, which is gonna reset the hand, bringing it down below the next ratchet tooth so that it can act upon that ratchet tooth again. We also have the pump here that is our cylinder stop being brought down out of contact so the cylinder can rotate again when we go ahead and cock the hammer or pull the trigger in double action mode. Then finally we have the reset of the slider here. And this happens via the contact here 
with the trigger. So there's a little lever on the end of the trigger that fits into this slot and the slider. So earlier, this lever acted upon the slider to push it up. Now it's gonna act upon this slope surface here to pull it down. So as the trigger comes down, it's gonna pull the slider along with it. And once the slider is brought out of contact with the pusher, the spring in the cylinder can act to push the cylinder to the rear. So we'll see that now. And the pusher is being driven to the rear and you can see even the firing pin pivot because of the different positioning of the pusher now. And now you have a different angle that that channel is going to have so that the firing pin is going to have to pivot to meet that new angle. And the spring is going to drive the cylinder back. And it does this by just pushing onto the plug. And because the plug can't go anywhere, it's going to push the cylinder backwards. And now we have the cylinder back in its rearmost position and everything is reset. Now, as far as the double action uh, mode of this firearm, it works a lot like uh, a lot of the other designs we've used. Pretty much the trigger is gonna come up and catch this lever here and pull the hammer back. Very similar to other designs we've seen. So I'm not gonna really showcase that. Just look back on my previous videos to see how that double action functionality works. And it's pretty much the same way that the uh, Nagant works here. After spending several minutes explaining to you how a lot of the mechanical functionality of the Nagant revolver works, it's time to get into the real meat of the question. And that is, what is a gas seal revolver and exactly how is a gas seal achieved? We've already covered half of the equation and that's the cylinder coming forward. It's time to talk about the other half of the equation. But before we do that, let's go ahead and discuss what a gas seal revolver is. A gas seal revolver is a revolver that seals all of the expanding gases created by the burning of the propellant and prevents it from escaping anywhere other than out the barrel. Now the importance of this is the fact that every other revolver design has what is called a cylinder gap. A cylinder gap is literally a gap in between the cylinder and the barrel. You can see that here. Now this is a little bit more dramatic in the Nagant revolver because it's a design that's meant to bring the cylinder and the barrel close together as you've already seen and we can see again here as we can see the whole purpose of bringing the cylinder forward is to close that gap but that in and of itself isn't enough to give us a gas seal and this is where the other half of the equation comes in the other half of the equation as i hinted at in the beginning of my video is ammunition itself as you can see the cartridge case actually extends a little bit beyond the length of the cylinder this is to allow it to be inserted into the barrel when the cylinder comes forward. So as you can see here, with the cylinder in the rearmost position, the cartridge case is back far enough that it allows it to rotate through without being obstructed by the barrel. But when the cylinder comes forward, we see the end of the cartridge case being inserted inside the barrel. And this is going to depend upon the same kind of principles we've seen with other firearm designs that aren't revolvers, in that you get a nice gas seal when the expanding gases push the cartridge walls up against the inside of the chamber, or in this case, the barrel. So as the cartridge is ignited, we can see the expanding gases push the case wall up against the barrel giving us a nice gas seal preventing those gases from going anywhere other than down the barrel which is exactly what we want now what are the advantages of this style of revolver a gas seal revolver over a more traditional revolver design which is going to have a cylinder gap well it's going to focus all of the expanding gases down the barrel giving you the most efficiency whereas a traditional revolver is going to have consequences of that cylinder gap first you're going to have some of the expanding gases escape out of that gap. The vast majority of the expanding gases will go down the barrel, but some of it will also be redirected out of that cylinder gap. This has two consequences. First, you lose some of the power of the expanding gases because you're not, getting, you're not being able to utilize all of the expanding gases because some of it is escaping. The other consequence is that it can be harmful to the shooter if they're not aware of the cylinder gap. If they had part of their hand, or maybe somebody nearby was close to the revolver, the expanding gases escaping out the cylinder gap can be harmful. So it's always a good idea to keep your hands safely away from the cylinder gap in a revolver, and that is kind of the basic elements of safely operating a revolver. 
You don't have this with a gaseous revolver if it's operating properly. There will be no expanding gases escaping out of that cylinder gap, possibly harming you. Another advantage is the fact that you can suppress a gaseous revolver, and you can't suppress a traditional revolver with a cylinder gap. This is because some of the noise created by the firing of the revolver is going to escape out that cylinder gap, and there's no real way to suppress that noise. So you're going to lose a lot of the effectiveness of the suppressor if you put it on the end of a revolver. Whereas a gassier revolver not having those expanding gases and that gap to allow some of the noise to escape is going to be much more effectively suppressed. That being said, there's a definite reason why there aren't very many examples of gassier revolvers, with the Nagant revolver being the only mass-produced example of a gassier revolver. And that's due to its disadvantages. Firstly, we have the mechanical complexity. You have a number of extra parts that all are required for the functionality of the revolver. We have the slider, we have the pusher, we have the spring and the plug within the cylinder that are all required. Those are parts that you would not normally find in a revolver, and the more parts you have, the more complexity, the more that can go wrong, the more parts that can break, and so on. Also, the increased cost of production. Then you have the fact that the Nagant, again being the only mass-produced example of a gaseous revolver, has a fixed cylinder. Now, this was more typical in the era that it was first designed, although uh, getting on in years at this point, there were already swing-out uh, cylinder revolvers in uh, this period. But it wasn't too uncommon, and it works very similarly to the way a Colt Single Action Army works as far as the relo reloading process goes. So you have a loading gate over here, which you'd flip down, then you'd pull out the ejector rod here, and you would manually push out the cartridge cases, manually rotate the cylinder, push out the next one, and so on. Now, unlike a Colt Single Action Army, the Nagant revolver does not have a spring-loaded mechanism that brings the ejector rod forward, so you have to do that manually, so it does slow down the process slightly, make it a little bit more awkward, and then once you're done with that, you go ahead and feed in your, nut, your new cartridges. Again, very similar process, and then you just flip your loading gate closed, and you're ready to go. So that can be a disadvantage, but I could see that possibly you could design the, a gassy revolver to operate in a more traditional, modern, swing-out cylinder design. But the only example we have is a fixed cylinder, and with seven shots, it can be quite a lengthy process to unload and reload the revolver. Now we get into what I consider the biggest disadvantage of a gassy revolver, and this is something that gets a little bit complicated, and one of the things I think a lot of people miss out on when you discuss the disadvantages of a gassy revolver. As a matter of fact, whenever I see a discussion about gassy revolvers, it's usually people point out the mechanical complexity for the main reason why it was not adopted by more militaries outside of Russia, or by police forces, or by uh, the civilian market. It's mostly people say, oh, it costs too much because of the mechanical complexity. That's not the real problem. The real problem is the specialized ammunition. Now, this problem is multifold, so let's first take a look at it from the logistics standpoint, and as far as the military is concerned. Well, you have the specialized ammunition that has a very particular design. It has an extended brass case that extends beyond the bullet, further than you would have for a, a similar cartridge that would give you the similar capabilities. That brass costs money. You're, you're making that ammunition more expensive by having more material. But then you also have the specialized element of having to have the end of it crimped in and other things that make the manufacturing process a little bit more expensive. So in the end, this specialized ammunition is gonna cost more to manufacture. That cost adds up. So it's not really the cost of the firearm that's the problem, it's the cost of ammunition. Militaries are always more concerned about logistical costs than they are about acquiring costs. I mean, that's always a consideration, but in the end, it's the cost to keep the firearm running that's going to always outweigh the advantages that that firearm may have. And in the case of a gas seal revolver, those advantages are just not enough for a lot of militaries. Again, you have the mechanical complexity and some of the other disadvantages we're going to talk about in a bit. But then you have the main advantage being you get a little bit more efficiency, a little bit more velocity because you're using all of those expanding gases. But at best, you're getting somewhere in between 10 to 20 percent. That's just not considered to be enough of an advantage to really justify the cost. And then you get into 
ideas of supply and demand. And this is where what's really going to hurt the civilian market. And this is something that, you know, if you're not really versed in economics, you, you might just get all glossy eyed when I bring up supply and demand. But simply put, supply and demand are going to determine the cost of something. So let's say you have 380 Auto. Now that is a smaller cartridge that in theory should cost less than the larger 9mm Luger. Uh, you have more brass involved because the cartridge case is larger. Uh, you oftentimes have heavier bullets, which is also more material. You have more propellant, which is more material, and so on. So in theory, 9mm Luger or Parabellum should cost more. But why don't you actually see that in practice? Well, that's supply and demand in work. There is a lot of supply. There's also a lot of demand, which gives manufacturers that ammunition the incentive to produce the supply. And that's why you have lower costs. But with a specialized ammunition, like for instance, the ammunition that the Nagant uses, you only have specific firearms that are going to be using that. Now, something I've oftentimes heard amongst people that are, you know, see a gas uh, seal revolver design uh, is something to the effect of, oh, if only they made a revolver in 357 Magnum that is a gas seal revolver. Well, that doesn't work because you have to have specialized ammunition. Uh, three, just off the shelf 357 Magnum is not going to work in that revolver. You're going to have to have that very specialized ammunition. And oftentimes when I brought that up in the forums or video comments that I've seen that, usually they say something like, oh, well, they just make a specialized cartridge for that. Well, therein lies the problem. Who's going to buy that specialized ammunition? Only people that have gas seal revolvers. Somebody that has a normal 357 Magnum wouldn't buy that. Why would I spend the extra cost in the ammunition when I don't need it? And it might not even function properly in my revolver because you have that extra case line. So therein lies the rub. You're just not going to have the same kind of supply that you have with some other off-the-shelf ammunition that you might be thinking of. So maybe in theory, 357 Magnum uh, revolver that's a gas seal revolver might be better if, again, they made the ammunition specially designed to work in a gas seal revolver. That might be great because you're working with more velocity, so that 10 to 20% benefit is going to be more substantial than the lower velocity ammunition that you use in a Nagant. Okay, that might be a valid consideration, but who is going to be able to afford a very, very expensive specialty ammunition? And does that outweigh the cost of the revolver and the cost of the ammunition to the, the general public? And it seems like the answer was no, because this really didn't go anywhere outside of its adoption by the Russian military. Oh, but wait, we're not done talking about the disadvantages of the Nagant revolver and by extension, any gassier revolvers that would be based upon its design. And if you've ever owned a Nagant model 1895, then you're well aware of this disadvantage, and that is its horrifically heavy trigger pull. Now, the single action trigger pull is based upon the resistance of the trigger's return spring, and that could be easily modified without changing the overall functionality of the revolver. But in double action trigger pull, you not only have the resistance of the trigger return spring here, but also the resistance of the hammer's spring here. Now that's the typical kind of resistance you would see in any double action revolver, the trigger return spring and the spring that drives the hammer. But with a gas seal revolver, you have a little bit extra resistance because you're also driving the mechanical parts that bring the cylinder forward. So you have the slider coming up, being driven by the uh, trigger, sliding along the pusher, driving the pusher forward, and then the pusher pushes on the cylinder which is being, that motion is being resisted by the cylinder's return spring. So not only do you have the resistance of the spring tension of that, uh, the cylinder's spring, but you also have the friction of all of these parts rubbing up against each other. And these are more parts than what you would have in a traditional revolver. So friction is always gonna make your trigger a little bit more gritty or slightly heavier if you have a little bit of uh, resistance due to that, uh, that friction. With a gas seal revolver, if you're basing it upon the Nagant, you're gonna have more friction because you have more parts rubbing up against each other. So this, these elements are going to add a significant amount of weight to a double action trigger pull. And designing around that is gonna be rather difficult. You're gonna to have to come up with a completely different mechanism to drive a gas seal revolver if you're gonna overcome this disadvantage. 
And yes, you could make the trigger return spring lighter, which would improve the double action trigger pull, but that is an improvement that you could make on any traditional double action revolver and not anything that would give you uh, more benefit overall in a gas seal revolver than you could get out of, again, a traditionally uh, designed revolver. So a traditionally designed revolver is always going to have a better trigger pull, especially in double action mode. Single action, action mode, you could get it close uh, to a traditionally designed revolver because all of these other parts aren't really affecting that single action trigger pull too much. I mean, you're going to have the trigger interact with the slider slightly and things like that. But for the most part, the only real resistance you're getting is that trigger return spring. But in double action mode, you're definitely having all these resistances and there's no real way to avoid it. Well, that's going to wrap up my discussion of the Nagant revolver and, again, by the extension, gas seal revolvers. I had planned to make this a video that included two different firearms, but considering the length uh, of time that I've spent discussing this particular model, I think I'm going to save that for another video in the future. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. This is Mouse Gunner, signing out.